But now we come across a topic that is typically not covered in calculus, but it's a very important technique to know. And it involves what some people call differentiating under the integral sign. And so to explain what that means, I'm going to start right from the beginning and state the main theorem. This is called Leibniz's rule for differentiating integrals. And the idea is that we have an integral that's a function of two variables, okay, x and y. Generally, we're going to be thinking about integration over some rectangular region. You can extend this, but I'm not going to do that right now. And the idea is that as long as the function and the derivative with respect to x are both continuous, then if we create some integral or we're integrating over y, and the limits of integration also can be functions of x. So this is the most general statement of this, of this theorem. Then the integral itself is differentiable with respect to x. And this tells us what the derivative is. And so notice that there's three parts. Okay, the first part is where I'm differentiating the integrand. But notice that the differentiation is going to be a partial derivative, right? Because the, integ the integrand itself, the function in the integrand is really a function of two variables. Then there's the endpoints. Notice what happens with the endpoints is I'm substituting in the limits of integration at both of the endpoints, and I'm doing very much like what we do in a definite integral. Okay, the, I have an upper limit of integration minus the lower limit of integration, and the only difference is I have to multiply by the derivative associated with those limits of integration. Okay. So this is a general formula. I think when you look at it and you, th and you think about it, the pattern, the idea will make sense. I'm not going to go through the proof, although it isn't that difficult. Um, we're just going to take this as given. Now there's something that's important, which is you can think of x as a variable or, or a parameter, and both are actually very useful. And I'm going to show you how to use it with both um, ways of thinking. So first I'm going to look at this in the case where I'm thinking of this second variable as being really a parameter. So notice that I'm doing the integration with respect to x, and I'm thinking of a as a parameter here. And I claim that I know what this integral is. And in fact, we're going to evaluate this for a homework problem. You're going to see exactly what it is we're going to actually prove this. If I know this is true, then I could ask the question, well, what is this integral? Where now I have x squared. Now, you can convince yourself that you cannot do this with integration by parts. This is a claim on my part, but I claim if you try integration by parts, you'll find that you can't do this. But what we do instead is we make a very interesting observation. We realize that if I take the derivative of this quantity with respect to a, I end up getting this. Okay, I get the integrand. So it makes perfect sense now to differentiate with, under the integral sign. Now notice that here, this is a case where we do not have a bounded rectangle. However, however, um, both the derivative and the function are continuous on any closed interval that has this form. Okay, both f and the partial with respect to a are continuous for every minus m and positive m. Therefore, in the limit, it's also true. So I can still use this theorem. Okay. And so I go ahead, I apply it, I'm going to take the derivative of square root of pi over a, and take the derivative on the left-hand side, I just move it inside the integral, 
And when I do, I end up getting the following result. As, as I showed before, this when I move the derivative inside, I get minus x squared times e to the minus ax squared. And on this side, of course, taking the derivative is straightforward. And I just go ahead and multiply through by negative 1, and I get my result. And so this is a very useful way of, of, of evaluating integrals um, that have a more complicated form if you know the simpler form of an integral. Now we want to look at a situation where we're thinking of the second variable, the, 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 the second variable is really a variable and not a parameter. And I'm going to show you a very um, useful technique to find the expected value of a random variable. It's called the moment generating function. And so I'm going to suppose that x is a random variable. It has some probability distribution function f. And I'm going to define the following function, the moment generating function. It's going to be the expected value of e to the tx. Okay. This is a little bit like a Laplace transform, except instead of going from 0 to infinity, you're going from minus infinity to positive infinity. Of course, very often, the PDF is, is not defined, so it ends up being a Laplace transform. Okay, in any case, what we're going to show, and this is the important thing, is that if I can do this integral, and I take the derivative of m with respect to t, and evaluate it at t equal to 0, I get the expected value of x. And if I keep on taking successive derivatives of m with respect to t and evaluating at 0, I get the expected value for higher powers of x. And I want to show you how this actually works. Suppose I have a, a uh, normally distributed random variable with a mean of mu and a standard deviation of sigma. I'm going to show that the expected value of x is mu and the expected value of x squared is mu squared plus sigma squared. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to set up our moment generating function and I'm going to re-express the exponent of the exponential as a perfect square. And when you go through the algebra you end up getting this expression right here. Okay. And now I'm going to define an, a new mu. Okay, notice this looks like the portion of a normal distributions PDF where I redefine my mean as being mu tilde and I put this in and I end up getting the following expression. Now I'm going to put this back into the integral and I'm going to claim, and again we're going to show this as a homework problem, that this thing evaluates to 1 and I'm left with the portion outside the integral for my moment generating function. And again, I would urge you to, to, to verify all of these steps, okay, but this is what you get. So this is my moment generating function. It's not that difficult for a normal distribution. And now I'm going to try what we said a second ago. I'm going to go ahead and take the derivative of mu, evaluate it at 0, and see if I get the mean. And when I do, I take the derivative with respect to t, I get the following expression. Evaluate at t equal to 0. Of course, the exponent here just becomes 0. So this evaluates to 1. And I end up getting mu, as, as, as expected. And I do the same thing for the expected value of x squared. I take the second derivative of m with respect to t, evaluate at 0. And when you do, we get this result. And we know this is true because we know that sigma squared, the variance, is equal to the expected value of x squared minus the square of the expected value of x, which we just showed was mu squared. So we know that this result is in fact correct. And this is a very powerful technique. Um, these sorts of transform methods, this is a very elementary type of transform method, is very important. And in fact, there's a thing called the characteristic function, which is where we integrate this. 
and sometimes it actually comes in handy. And just as this is like a Laplace transform, this is like a Fourier transform. And we're going to find out that the moments of those transforms are very important. So this is kind of the first step into a deeper topic that we're going to come back to. All right, this ends it for the section on integration.